Hello and welcome to Tabletop Bellhop Live Episode 2 Child's Play. Coming to you from Hamilton, I'm Sean and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of gaming, game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to all the visitors in the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch. It's great of you to join us and take part in the episode. For those not here live, remember you can join us every Thursday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. A little housekeeping before we get on with our show. We've received some great feedback already and we wanted to let listeners to know that we hear you and we're working on it to make this the best show we can, both in content and technically. From Jess, Jeff S., we heard, aside from the kinks that every first episode of every cast needs ironing out, I enjoyed it. I love that your angle is helping people run better games, game nights, and get into the hobby. That is awesome to hear, since that is exactly what we are going for. Uh, what I'd wanted to make when I first came up with the idea for Tabletop Bellhop was a Dear Abby for gamers, for those of you my age and Sean's age who remember Dear Abby. Uh, for something more modern, if you listen to the Happy Jacks RPG podcast, you'll get the same thing. I wanted a... Uh, a letter show, a call-in show where people would send questions and I would use my years of gaming experience to answer those. It was a niche I didn't see out there. There were lots of shows doing reviews and other things, but I didn't see anyone just answering gaming and game night questions. And uh, if you check my About Me page on tabletopbellhut.com, you can see why I felt I was qualified to uh, sit in the chair right now. Another question, or sorry, not question, another comment we got comes from nick the rat not bad listen to the entire thing we'll tune in again the only complaint is your mic is the butters the other guys is crap nice work weird though on youtube sean's mic sounds better well what really happened here last week is that more isn't always better my mic was turned up a little high and mo's was a little low and we just kind of lost a little bit when we were balancing it out in the end so in the week uh, since last We've uh, spent a little time, worked on our audio a little bit, and hopefully we have a better baseline audio to make sure we deliver to you guys the best uh, audio podcast quality we can. Uh, and next we have something from Chris Sneziak. says, love the show, nice format, excellent information, engaging hosts, bordering on family friendly, enjoyable stuff. Looking forward to the next episode. Well, I'd like to think oh, yeah. we're going to stick right in family friendly, but I'll take it. Yeah, we are going to try to be family friendly. We, uh, If we do slip up, that's another reason we'll be using the bell. Hopefully you never have to hear it except between segments. So huge, huge shout outs to Chris. Chris is one of the main men behind the Misdirected Mark um, family of podcasts, which is the media arm of the Encoded Design Studio. It's a, it's a big gaming conglomerate that does a lot of online podcasting. They are doing actual plays. They are game designers. They're published game designers. They're launching Kickstarters. A great network of people that I have been following for quite a few years. They were a huge inspiration to us. And to hear something so positive coming from Chris, who has done this for 300 episodes, when we were only on episode one, blows my mind. That is fantastic. Thumbs up to you, Chris, and the misdirected and Mark crew. All right, well, we really appreciate your comments and suggestions. And if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. And that's S-E-A-N. And now on a Tabletop Gaming Weekly. This is the point where we take a look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit the Bellhop's tabletop this week? Last week. So... Yes. <laughs> Can't see in the future yet. Uh, every week I like to take a look back at the games that we played, any events we've attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. This is also a weekly feature over at tabletopbellhop.com, the blog side of this, where I post a week in review as what did you play Mondays, a rather popular hashtag you'll find all over the net. Um, let's see. Week before, we talked about Bruges, a Steffenfeld game, the one that I kind of 
was like, wow, it's like quick Stefan Feld, words that don't go together. Well, I got two more plays into that. Not once, not twice. We, or Sorry, not once, but twice we played games of Bruges on Monday night. And man, it went over well. We were playing with people who had never played before. We tried a three-player, which I hadn't done before. It was just as good as four-player. A fantastic game. Really glad I finally got that to the table. And then we played Azul. Friday night, I had Tori and Cat over, I mentioned last time, when we played our Pandemic Legacy game. I remember last time I mentioned about the box of shame being opened. Well, the box of shame was not only shameful, to me, it ruined the end of the campaign. Like, this was a legacy game that we played, you know what, I don't remember the count offhand, but say about 16 sessions, might have been closer to 18, because we did fail four in a row. Uh, it's, it was a long commitment. There was a lot we did in that game. It took a lot of hours to play, and the ending just fell flat. All because of this box of shame. It made the game too easy. I honestly think we couldn't lose. Like, like we would have had to throw the game. We would have had to just go, oh, I'm just going to run in circles instead of actually curing diseases. That really bummed me out. Like, Pandemic Legacies, the number two rated game in the world, according to Board Game Geek, and here we had that bad an experience with it. So a little bummed out by Pandemic Legacy. And at this point, I highly doubt I'll be picking up Pandemic Legacy Season 2. I just don't think that's in the cards for us. Now, I wonder, could a lot of those ratings, the high ratings coming in, be people who have not yet finished the game? Are we seeing a skew of ratings? That is highly possible. I hadn't thought of that. The other thing, too, is this isn't going to happen to everyone, right? Like, we just happened to hit that failure point in November and then we play you play one game a month we're leading into December the last month of the game where everything kind of changes up I'm not going to spoil anything um so if we had hit that box back in January especially well I guess you couldn't get to lose four games so say we hit that box at the end of March it probably wouldn't have had the impact it did but there's stuff in there that makes the game easier and we got to use it all which just was was overpowering. It was too much. And then there's another part of it where at the end of the game, this is not a spoiler, I don't think. It's out there on the web. And really, if you consider this a spoiler, I apologize. But at the end of the game, you, there's a scorecard. You get marked on how well you did. Like, I'm not giving anyway any plot here. We got in the mid-range. Like, there's whatever. I can't remember how many levels. We were about in the middle. If it wasn't for that box, we would have been in second tier, like the second from the top. I wish there was something in the scoring that was like, open the box, but if you don't use what's in it, then you get some bonus points. So like, yeah, it's there in case you need it. Meanwhile, we just, we used and abused it because there was no reason not to. Sounds fair. So then, um, what do we do? We played a game. What do we do after we play a game? We then played Azul. So Saturday, we had uh, together and this time we decided to start with Azul. <laughs> so I, I, we, we have played so much Azul. Azul has become the filler game we play all the time. So Saturday, I had a bunch of people over because I wanted to do a review. I was going to review a game called The Thing, Infection at Outpost 31. This is by all companies, USAopoly puts this out, which kind of blows my mind. But hey... They did pretty good with Nefarious, so they put out a Thing game. Now, this is based on John Carpenter's The Thing. And I could say more now, but there's something we're looking at modifying the show. And depending on timing, we may be adding a review segment to the end of the show. And if we have time, you'll hear a heck of a lot more about The Thing later. All right. Well, we record the show live Thursday nights at 9.30 Eastern on Twitch. And... Taking a peek into our chat room, we see we're a little more uh, crowded this week. I'd like to say hi to Decaf Smurf, Dyson Capes, uh, Kibitz J, Slow Cool, and thank you to our moderator, and she games. Hello, everyone. Uh, Any interesting conversations going on? No, not just yet. We're just saying hi, and uh, everyone, I think, is just entranced by uh, what happened on the tabletop <laughs> this last week. <laughs> all right sounds good you in the chat feel free to ask questions feel free to comment 
we do have a moderator who's moderating. I'm trying to watch it while I'm talking. I'll admit I'm not, not all my focus is there. Sean's also paying attention. So if you do have anything you want to say, feel free to talk and speak up. So after a week of mostly patient waiting, we were finally accepted across the major podcast hosting platforms. You can now find us on Google Play, iTunes, Spotify, TuneIn, and on Stitcher. We also have a direct feed link available on the blog post for those who want to skip third party and get it direct. And if there's a way you prefer to listen to podcasts and you don't find us on it, give us a shout at one of our at Tabletop Bellhop emails and we'll see what we can do for you. Now that the podcast is live, all the pieces are in place. I think we can officially say Tabletop Bellhop has launched. We've got the blog. We're streaming here live on Twitch. You can find video archives on YouTube. And the audio podcast can be found on podcatchers everywhere. That is something worth celebrating. So we're throwing a party, and you're all invited, digitally speaking. That's right. On Saturday, August 11th, I'm going to host a 12-hour gaming extravaganza, and I want you all to join in. I'm going to have a bunch of friends and family over at my house, and we're going to stream the entire thing right here live on Twitch. That's at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop for those of you not watching live. Assuming we can get things set up, the stream will be running from 2 p.m. until 2 a.m. Eastern on the 12th. Expect to see people playing games and having fun. Along with that, we've got some special things planned. Like a live in-person recording. It'll be the first time the two of us have been able to record next to each other live and in person. I picked up a copy of Catan Chocolate Edition to add to the celebration. I thought it was fitting based on our first episode and all the Catan discussion. So we're going to stream a live play and live eat of that. And what's a party without presents? We're going to be having giveaways during the event. And anyone in the lobby, our live chat room here on Twitch, will be eligible to win. I picked up a copy of the hot new Big Trouble in Little China board game at Origins. You have got to see this thing. It looks fantastic. Miniatures, uh, which way book, style adventure, funky custom dice, two-sided game board. I've even got a five demon bag that I'm going to be able to break out. We are going to live stream that at 8 p.m. You know what old Jack Burton always says at a time like this? (laughs) The checks in the mail. We'll be inviting guests to stop by the camera and say a few words, you know, speaker's corner style. And you know what else? We're going to have you join us on 11, August 11th from 2 to 2 to find out. Note, this is an open house. You don't have to be here the whole time. Stop in, say hi, join the party, come in for an hour, come in for two. Stop and chat, hang out with my friends. If seeing us live on Twitch isn't enough, you can find both Sean and I live and in person at the Queen City Conquest in September. This is a smaller local con hosted at the Buffalo Niagara Convention Center in Buffalo, New York. This will be our first official con appearance and I'd love to meet you. All right, so now each episode of... Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Now, each episode... We have outtakes. <laughs> Each episode of Tabletop Bellhop Live, we endeavor to answer one or more of your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or you can head over to the webpage, tabletopbellhop.com, and click on Ask the Bellhop, where you can find a variety of ways to get in touch. We need your questions. We're here to help, but we can't help if we don't know what's going wrong on your game nights. So for tonight... Brian Kurtz, Tabletop Bellhop Patron, asks, I'm looking for advice on cooperative tabletop games to play with kids of different ages, grade school, grade school through high school. I have enjoyed Hoot Owl Hoot for very young kids and Forbidden Island for older kids, and I have heard good things about Pandemic. Are there less well-known options I should be checking out? Man, there are lots of kids' games out there. It's gotten so much better over the years. There are so many great choices now. It's no longer Candyland and Sorry and Trouble and Perfection. Like there are really good kids games out on the market right now. And what I love is 
the old kids games, yes, they may teach the kids basic skills, which is pretty cool. Like they, they teach how to take turns or they teach memorization or planning ahead, things like that. But they were only really fun for kids. So to me, the best kids games you can have in your game collection as a family are those that are enjoyed by both kids and adults. That to me is, is the golden zone. That's the, the perfect game. That's what you want at home. Now, Brian added a twist. He is looking for co-op games, cooperative games, games that you play together, win together, or lose together. That makes things a little harder. Now, the ones Brian mentioned, Forbidden Island, great game. Actually, a little tidbit, back when my kids were just learning to read, Forbidden Island actually is something that got Big G to, to dig in, to try harder. Having her, and all we were having her do is in that game, you flip over a card and you look for a matching island. So we would flip over the card and we would read the island to her and then we would tell her to find the tile without showing her the picture so she would have to recognize the words. That actually gave her a big push towards reading. Another one that also did that was um, King of Tokyo, surprisingly enough. No, not co-op. Um, hoot, 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 owl, hoot. I have to admit some ignorance here. I don't know that one. Now, when I was doing research for this question on the blog, I did see it come up multiple times. Brian says it's good. It's probably worth checking out. Pandemic? I haven't tried with my little ones, but uh, as you just heard in the last segment, I played Pandemic Legacy an awful lot. I played the original Pandemic an awful lot, and it's it's solid. It's, it's okay, but I think there's a better suggestion, which I'll get to in a moment. So the... Number one game for me for playing with kids right now is a game called Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters. Now, if you're going to look that up online, it's fighting, not fighting. There's no G. Fighting Treasure Hunters. Uh, that is a cooperative game where four players are playing little kids sneaking into a haunted house to try to steal treasures. And everyone who has played this game loves it. It's simple enough for kids to get. There is no reading. On your turn, you get so many. You roll a die to see how far you move. Oh, my God, it's a roll and move. You roll a die to see how far you can move. You go into rooms, and you try to sneak out these treasures and avoid the ghosts. The problem is, after you've moved, you draw a card, and a new ghost comes out in one of the rooms. If you get too many ghosts in a room, that room becomes haunted. You get too many haunted rooms and the kids lose the game because they can't escape from the house. Oh, no. So you're all working together to sneak in. And the way working together works is when you're fighting the ghost, you roll a die to see if you beat the ghost. Well, if there's two of you there, you roll extra dice. So it's encouraging teamwork. It's encouraging planning ahead. There's problem solving. Wait, this room's getting bad. This one's getting worse. Which one do we go to next? It is a phenomenal game. Not only that, as was proven in my 2017 Gaming in the New Year party, this game is just as popular with adults as it is with kids. This was the first year we let Big G stay up with us till midnight, and we let her bring her games, and this is one of the great games she brought. I think we played like eight times, or she played like eight times, and every time she played with a different group of adults, they'd come in the room, they'd play with her, like, oh my god, this game's so good. I well, think then I she went to it bed. Three times. <laughs> yeah, at least, at least. Then she heads to bed, and we keep playing. I think that game was out on the table till like two, three a.m. as different groups just played it. Like to me, that's it's the perfect kids game. The kids love it. Oh, I missed one point. I have also come home from work and caught the kids playing it by themselves. So that shows that they can grasp it and play it on their own. Another fantastic quality. Now, another really popular one with my girls is a game called Outfoxed. I've got to thank Tom Vassell at the Dark, at the dark Tower. Oh, it's evil Tom. He has a goatee. Actually, normal Tom may have a goatee. Sorry, Tom Vassell at the Dice Tower. Probably the most popular, most famous board gaming network. The one Chris claims will be more famous than. Would love that. Uh, I have to thank him for bringing this one to my attention. I, he's featured it many times on his show. He's talked about how much his kids love him. He has eight kids. Um, Outfoxed is a deduction game. So it's you're trying to solve a mystery. So you have a town. You have all these different houses. And... There's a bunch of foxes in the town. One of them stole, I don't remember the character's name, but a pot pie and ate it. And 
you are the detectives trying to figure out which of the foxes stole the pot pie. Now, the way this works is, again, you roll a move. You roll a die, figure out how far you can go, and then you try to discover clues. The first thing you need to do is reveal the suspects. When you reveal the suspects, they show up on the, the, their cards. You put them out on the outside of the board. Then, revealing a clues, they have this cute little plastic thing. If you go on the blog post, I've got a picture of it there, where you pick up the clue and you put it in this thing, and you have a little slider that slides out, and all it does is it shows either a green or a white dot. And I can't remember which is which, but one of them is this person has the item on the clue and the other is they do not. So there'll be like a monocle and it says monocle with a green dot. Well, the suspect wears a monocle. If it's a monocle without a green dot, then no, they don't have a monocle. So then you get the clue and you look at the suspect you've revealed and you're like, oh, wait, this person doesn't have a monocle. They can't be the, the suspect. Let's eliminate them. Now, added to that is a memory element, because if you haven't revealed all the suspects by the time you have the clue, you have to remember later. It's like, oh, I flipped up Mrs. Fox later. She's got a monocle. Wait, do you remember what that clue was earlier? Um, I don't know a better game to teach little kids logic. Like, this is the whole, you know, Jimmy's in the room and Jimmy's taller than Kevin and Kevin's three times taller than this guy and who was born first, you know, those kind of questions. This is the real basic version of that. And it is fantastic. Now this one, since I talked to the kids the other day about co-op games, they can't stop playing. Every time I go in the front room now, they're sitting on the floor playing out Foxed again. Like they were playing it before, but like they're now reinvested in it. And I was working on a blog post earlier and all of a sudden, my oldest runs in. She's like, I finally won out Fox. I finally won out Fox. And I'm like, well, we've won before. She's like, no, I was playing by myself and I won. And I'm like, hey, cool. Now, this is something that didn't come up when I wrote the blog post about this. I didn't even think of that. You can play this game solo. So that's pretty cool. That's something you don't get very often, again, in kids' games. My other big suggestion, this goes back to the pandemic comment I made at earlier, is Flashpoint Fire Rescue. So this is, again, of, of course, a co-op game. This one I'd recommend for older kids. Just the, the theme is could be a little intense, which same thing with pandemic. I don't mean old kids, like not necessarily teenagers, but older. So in Flashpoint Fire Rescue, you play firemen, fire people, I should say. You're playing fire, fire persons. Sorry, I had fire people. Fire you play fighters. whatever the... Firefighters. Firefighters. There we go. Firefighters. There. Thank you. You play firefighters, and of course, you're fighting fires because you have a big board, and you put uh, you roll some dice to figure out where flames go, and the building's on fire, and each turn you get four actions. Now, this is a, a pandemic callback. Pandemic, you have a bunch of cubes spread out all over the board. You had to go get the cubes, and you have four actions, and one of the actions is move. Pandemic, one of the actions is move. One of the actions in Pandemic is cure a disease cube. One of the actions in Flashpoint is put out a fire. There's a lot of crossover here. Uh, the big thing in Flashpoint, though, is instead of a abstract, here's a map of the world and we're moving cubes all over it. And yeah, they represent diseases, but you just kind of feel like, oh, my God, there's too many cubes here. You're never like, holy crap. They're, oh, holy, there's... I almost slipped up the, the PG thing there. We went PG instead of rated G. Um, they're, they're <laughs> Give me a second. All right. So, oh, my God, the Congo is being run by Ebola. You're just like, hey, there's too many red cubes over there. Where I find Flashpoint really hits home is the big thing you are doing is you are getting in trying to rescue people and pets from a fire. It has so much more emotional impact. It, it's zoomed in. Like you're you're not looking at this big abstract map of the world. You're you're looking at a burning building, and there's a little question mark token there. And then you get to it and flip it over, and you're like, oh, it's grandma. I saved grandma from the fire. This is awesome. Or there's a puppy dog or a cat. For some reason, I find all the kids are much more interested in saving the animals than the people. But it is it is yes. It is a very cool game. I strongly recommend it over Pandemic. Actually, in multiple ways. I personally, as an adult, would rather play Pan Flashpoint than Pandemic. 
Then here's the really brilliant thing that makes it a great game for kids, okay? You can introduce your kids to this fairly young where they're just playing the basic four firefighters. All they're trying to do is put out the fires. And if the fires get too bad, yes, in the game, the people don't escape, but you just word it as, you know, the, the backup crew shows up and saves the day and takes all the credit, right? You, you keep it a little less intense. But then there are so many optional rules. You can throw in a fire truck that you can drive around the outside of the building and it sprays a gout of water that takes out like a whole section of fire at a time. There's an ambulance for rushing around to get people out quicker. Each of the characters, instead of being just, we're all the same firefighter, get asymmetric abilities so that every character has something different they can do. There's, um, I'm trying to think just in the base game, but basically there's all these advanced rules. Uh, flashpoints, you can have explosives in the building so that when the fire spreads, if it hits the explosives, they blow up. Boom, bad. Uh, it's really cool because you can make it way harder. Now, this is how you scale the game for kids as they get older. You're like, yeah, you like you like uh, Flashpoint. Well, here, how about now instead of being Joe Fireman, sorry, Joe Firefighter, you can be this named guy who's the guy, the hose man, gets an extra put out a fire every turn it's very neat or woman person Host yes person. I, i'm trying i apologize <laughs> firefighters the 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 people fighting the fires so one of the things i found especially with older kids like i'm seeing it much more in big g than little g is the theme can sometimes be more important than the game so one of uh I mentioned this on the last episode. The best board game you own is the one that you can get to the table and play with your friends. Doesn't matter how good the mechanics are, how pretty the art is, how awesome the miniatures are, how much you paid for it on Kickstarter. If you don't play it, it's not a good game for your group. Well, same thing with kids' games. So one of the things I found with kids that can really get games to the table is theme. So right now, superheroes, hot, right? Like, Everyone is doing the superhero thing, even TV, not just the movies. One of the best superhero games I've ever played is a co-op card game called Sentinels of the Multiverse. No, you don't get the Marvel theme. You don't get the DC thing, but you get to feel like superheroes. The fantastic part about this game is it's all about teamwork. It's all about using your deck of cards really well with his deck of cards and her deck of cards and their deck of cards. We want to sit there, work together to defeat the villain. And it's a brilliant game in the fact that there are so many different heroes. Like I think the base game comes with eight heroes and three villains and villains and three different places to fight battles. You just grab different decks for each, sit down and start playing. Another one is if your kids are into RPGs or fantasy, Lord of the Rings, uh, Harry Potter, or they watch Critical Role right here on Twitch. Uh, there is a game out there called Mice and Mystics. This is a medieval fantasy RPG, or not RPG, sorry, medieval fantasy board game, story-based board game, where your characters have been turned into mice. So you are playing the prince and his retinue, trying to get turned back human and defeat the bad guys who have been turned into rats. This is almost an RPG. There's a storybook. There's a fantastic story that you read through. Uh, as you're playing, it's 100% cooperative. I started playing this with my kids probably a little too early, but it was great because we could still help, right? Like you move your mouse, tell me what you want to do, and I'll tell you how to do it. That's Mice and Mystics. Now, there is a newer game called Stuffed Fables. I have not had a chance to try, but everyone's telling me is the Mice and Mystics killer. Get that instead. So Take my recommendation with a grain of salt because maybe Stuff Fables is better, but I love Mites and Mystics. I've got a pile of it. I did notice in the chat room, Dyson Capes mentions Harry Potter's Hogwarts Battles. I have heard that's great. I have not played it. I am sorry. I've heard it's really good. Um, deck building game that starts off really simple with just the initial ones. Actually, a lot of gamers were complaining that it was too simple, but then as you get further in the books, you add more rules and it's supposed to get really good. So going back to thematic and theme games, if your kids are into League of Legends or any of the uh, MOBAs, there is a League of Legends co-op board game. 
I totally forgot about this on the blog post. This game is huge. You get it right from Rocks League Games. It's the only place to get it. And it has the best production value out of any board game I own. It is amazing looking. Like pre-painted miniatures that look like toys. There's, oh, it's it's crazy. It, it is a really good game. I would think older kids, a lot of reading. Um, it teaches program movement. So you're actually programming your mech and it runs through a routine every time based on how you programmed it. It's somewhat legacy. We talked about legacy games a bit last week. Uh, it's somewhat legacy. You don't write on anything or destroy anything, but there is unlocking. There's boxes that you open as you play. So I'm not going to talk too much about what you see in the game, but it escalates quickly and gets very interesting. And that's something worth noting. I'm talking about how watch your age ranges, but don't est underestimate kids' grasp of rules. I grabbed my first RPG at age nine and devoured it. I was able to grok that. Me and my cousin were playing Marvel superheroes from TSR, Yellow Box, battling Doc Ock with um, Captain Marvel, The Thing, and Spider-Man within, within weeks. Like, not even days, hours. I don't know. The, the first book, the battle book, I think we, we were up and running that day. And within a week, like, like this, this is RPGs, right? This is stuff you consider complex. I was reading AD&D probably by age 10. Like, kids don't... Kids games doesn't have to mean simple, especially once they start getting old. So what that really opens up is all the rest of the fantastic co-op games. Like if you've got a growing Jedi in your house and they're an avid reader and they like rule books and they like miniatures, pick up Imperial Assault. You can now play it co-op 100% with the app. Or if you prefer the whole DM player aesthetic, you can have one player play the Imperials and everyone else play, play the Rebels. It's a fantastic game. You get a ton of game in the box set. There's tons of expansions for it. Another suggestion for those kids who are into the darker horror stuff is Mansions of Madness, also from Fantasy Flight Games. That's another one that was a one versus many game that they've now opened up to pure co-op with an app. And the app in that is brilliant. If you buy an expansion, you just tell it that you own the expansion. And then it mixes in that stuff every time it generates a scenario. So just by owning the expansion, every game you play could be even better. The other thing, I, we generally have a tabletop focus of board games, but I play RPGs. Sean has played RPGs. We are an RPG family. Uh, Brian's got an awesome new tagline. I'm going to have to throw on my name soon, which uh, we'll probably start using a little more often, which is the uh, instead of cardboard concierge. So in addition to your cardboard concierge, I am also your RPG maitre d'. I love that. Thanks, Brian, for that one. Um, so I'm just going to throw out one RPG recommendation here. Aloy LaSanta made a game called Mermaid Adventures. It uses his PIP system. This is a 1D6 based RPG where the players, the kids, make mermaids. Now, the mermaids in that game are all kinds of different types. There's not just fish men. There's shark men and there's eel men and... Anemone women and octopus women and oh, there, there was all these classes. It is, it is fantastic. And really simple rules. The kids love the life path system. Part of character generation is having to draw your characters. They love that. Really simple system, really easy to teach, really easy to play. I, it was extremely impressed by it. I, I strongly recommend that. So... Those are my thoughts on kids' games, but who am I? I thought it would probably be a good idea to ask the experts. It's with pleasure I introduce our first guests on Tabletop Bellhop Live. My kids, Big G and Little G. Hi. Hello. This is the Tabletop Bellhop. These are my kids. I recently did a blog post on cooperative kids' games, and I fear who better to ask than the experts? Big G. What's your favorite games? My favorite cooperative game is Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters. Cooperative kids game is Outboxed. What are your favorite games overall? 
My favorite game overall is Star Wars Destiny. My favorite game overall is Robot Turtles. I like Star Wars Destiny because you can build your own decks and there's lots of dice and it's different even if you have the exact same deck every time you play it. Cool. What's the best part about uh, Foxed? It's just a really fun game. Fun. And and you can all share the, the win, basically. The reason why I like Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters is because I just like the way that it works. The reason why I like Robot Turtles is because you, you get to be a robot turtle and you can like Probably see stuff and you get to like move it around and it's really cool. All right. Well, we've done uh, quite an overview here. I see uh, Dyson Capes in the chat room was talking about uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles co-op as well. Uh, is that, I've is got that... a question about that one. Oh? There's two different Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle co-ops. I just wonder which one he's recommending. So there was a great big one. Oh, what was the name? I'm sure he can answer this. Anyway, big box one, but then there's also the Hero Clicks one. Shadows of the Past. Shadows of the Past, yes. That was good. That had a really neat mechanic where you rolled your dice pool and you put your dice in the order you want to use them. And here's the sweet part. The dice on the far left, you share with that turtle. And your dice on the far right, you share with that turtle. That was brilliant. Like, that, it was so cool that they did that. Wow, it sounds like they're rebooting that on Kickstarter, uh coming up soon Ooh, that's got to frustrate original backers but <laughs> <laughs> kind of cool i do recommend though of all things the teenage mutant ninja turtles hero clicks game they put out a starter box set and it has the full hero clicks rules but it also has a simpler set of rules that has a full co-op scenario in it and i'm actually surprised big g didn't mention that one because we had a fantastic weekend playing through that Excellent. Well, we've done quite the overview here, but if you're looking for something else to read, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com where the bellhop has covered this topic as a benefit to one of our patrons. Remember, if you've got a burning question, you can head over to our Patreon at patreon.com, tabletopbellhop, and support us at the good tip or better level, and your questions will get bumped to the top of the list. Speaking of Patreon... A shout out and thank you to our backer, Brian Kurtz. Thank you very much. And patron two. You could be patron two and be hearing your name right now. All right. And uh, back in the lobby, we've had a couple of other people join us. We've got uh, Commander Root and Banana. <laughs> <laughs> yellow and, uh, pickle, ickle, ickle. yellow yeah yellow pickle fruit uh, something or other uh <laughs> but uh we've already we've uh, we've been we've been covering the uh chat as we go so we haven't got too much but it looks, sounds like that uh original release is uh a little bit of a couple of issues in that uh that first teenage Mutant ninja turtles release uh, which is why they're uh rebooting yeah i brought it out to uh one of the local game stores uh, Brimstone Games. Shout out to Brimstone, great store. Um, we played two or three missions from the book, and it, it was okay. I I was hoping for better. I had heard very good things about it. Um, the original box set was very limited, uh, but the fact we didn't even want to finish the adventures that were in it is probably a pretty bad sign. So, it, it I don't know. It it was okay. All right, and now we've added a new segment for our second show, our featured review. In it, Bell, the Bellhop will talk about the latest game he's reviewed and give listeners a bit of insight into how the game played on his tabletop. So I mentioned this back at the top of the show when we were doing the week in review that on Saturday I had a group of friends over to play The Thing, Infection at Outpost 31. This was an interesting one for me. I will admit I was prompted to review this. Um, 
based on something I was doing before I started the bellhop, I owed someone a review of this game. So I wanted to get a group together. The first thing is I had to find a copy of the game, which proved more difficult than I thought it, excuse me, than I thought it would be. I kind of don't like social deduction games. So I didn't want to buy the game because I had a feeling I probably wouldn't like it. Can we just cover what social deduction games are for uh, the audience who might not know? In okay. Brief? Yeah. Social deduction games are when you need to read the other players. It uses real life skills. So you're not using a game mechanic. It's all about reading the other players you're playing with, which generally means that someone is going to be lying and you're going to have to tell if you can or not. And that is one of the big problems with social deduction games, because basically these are a group of games that are encouraging you to lie to your friends and to have your friends lie to you, which not everyone is cool with. Even more so, not everyone is good at it. So a social deduction game, on top of all the other mechanics, has some element of reading the other players at the table, trying to figure out what they're thinking. In most of these games, it's a hidden traitor. So everyone's working together, except someone there is possibly sabotaging the game. So an example of that is a game called Shadows Over Camelot. You're all knights of the round table. You're trying to do a bunch of quests. You're trying to find the Holy Grail. You're trying to find Excalibur. You're fighting off the Picts and the Normans. You're defending Camelot from siege engines. And it's really hard already because you're playing against the game, but then one of the knights might be a traitor and maybe working against you and sussing out who that is is a big part of the game. Now, I will admit that is one I actually like. There are a whole bunch of other ones. I'm sure anyone who has been to a game convention anywhere has seen a group of people playing Werewolf or Mafia. These are huge. Even at anime conventions, at comic cons, everywhere you go to a con, you will. You may not have realized you're walking past a group. If you see a big group of people staying around and someone says, close your eyes, werewolves, open your eyes, and so on, that's people playing Werewolf. Hugely popular game I can't stand for multiple reasons. Some of it being the, the whole social deduction part line, but it's not just that, it's werewolf, it, it's just not a good game. You've got 30 people standing around and in the first turn of the game, one of those people has to die in the game. Well, not the people don't die, their character they're playing dies, but that's werewolf extreme. Werewolf legacy edition. I don't think that one will sell well. <laughs> well, at least not more than once. <laughs> So the problem is that guy that gets picked out the first round, guy or girl, sorry, person who gets picked out the first round, um, they're out of the game. Like you just paid to go to a con and you probably bought a ticket to play a werewolf and everyone just kind of didn't like how you looked that day. So you're out because at that point, you don't have any real information to go on. There's, there's no deduction yet. It, at that point, it's a social game. There's no deduction. There's no information. There's no, oh, he must be this because. No, just, I don't like you. You're out. Goodbye. Go go play a different game or something. Sorry you paid to be here. I, I really don't like Werewolf. So from Werewolf Evolved, what I would consider better games from the company that wrote Werewolf, called One Night Ultimate. And there's One Night Ultimate Werewolf and One Night Ultimate Vampire and One Night Ultimate alien so this takes that same game but boils it down to uh one one role so everyone gets their their little role thing and tells them who they are they get to interact with each other they may swap some things around everyone does the close your eyes thing you open it and you all vote who's the werewolf who's the vampire who's the the alien and if you're right the the villagers win if not the werewolf wins and then of course there's a bunch of roles that break that much better game Still not a fan, but much better game. It, the other problem with social deduction games is why I don't like those games. Besides the fact that um, there's player elimination and all that, they're fragile. If you get just one player in that group that doesn't get it, they don't work. So going to a game I do like, Battlestar Galactica, this is a big box fantasy flight game. It takes many hours to play. And in it, at the start of the game, you know so many players are human and so many are Cylon. 
that's great. Everyone gets that, everyone rocks it, and you can generally play. Halfway through the game, some of the people may switch sides, and that confuses people. Also, because we play with a lot of RPG fans, people have a habit of role-playing Battlestar Galactica. And sometimes that's not how you want to play the game, because in the game, your character may not be the same as they were in the show. So you can play... Baltar, and you don't have to want to be the president. Like he did that in the show. You don't have to do that in the game. So we've had multiple problems playing Battlestar Galactica. One being where the person just doesn't understand the cards. So we get to that second phase where you're handed out a bunch of cards to determine if you change sides and someone doesn't get it. So an example is at the beginning of the game, they got a card that says you're a Cylon. Well, halfway through, if you get another card, it doesn't matter. You're still a Cylon. You stay a Cylon from that first card. But people will get it, and it says human, and they're like, oh, I guess I switched to human for the rest of the game. The really bad part is you don't find out till you're done, like four hours to six hours later. And then you're like, the, I just wasted four hours of my life playing this game that you screwed up because you didn't understand the cards. The same thing happens with the role players, right? So we're playing with my friend Dave, and he's playing Baltar, but he's playing Baltar. Like, he's just being it. Rated G show. Uh, almost slipped up there. He's, he's not being a nice man, and he's just doing everything he can to steal the presidency, and then he's doing everything he can to steal the nukes and waste them because he's in love with one of the Cylons. And I'm like, yeah, it's all in the show. I get it, but... That's not what's in the board game. So it it didn't work. Like we got to the end of the game and like, dude, you're a Cylon. And he's like, no, haven't you seen the show? Baltar's not a Cylon. And like, well, it's your loyalty cards, human and human, right? Of course, the Cylons won that game. So all they had to do is like, wow, Baltar's doing this is great. So anyway, that's probably way too much about games that aren't the thing. In fact, in post 31. So getting back to that. I didn't want to go buy it because I didn't expect to like it that much. So I got a hold of a bunch of local gamers. I'm like, dudes, anyone have this game? Like, I, I want to play. I'll hook up with you guys. We'll get to play it. Didn't work out. So I went and bought a copy. Again, thanks, Brimstone Games. Uh, and then broke it out and got a bunch of people over Saturday and played a few rounds. I, it it was good. Like, it was it was decent. It It was pretty good. So... Oh, I missed the resistance in that. So there was there was a wave of games that came out after games where they were really quick playing card games where you just, everyone gets a roll and it goes around the table and it's usually a pass fail. So a few games came out in this thing. So it's, I got to form a group of guys to go do a thing and some of the people in the group are spies and some are good guys and you got to try to form the right team so the proper team wins. So, and you go around and once one team wins three of the things or whatever. Once three missions pass, the good guys win. Once three missions fail, the spies win. Something to that extent. So that was another style of game. Those were even better than one night. I actually kind of liked those. There, there was no moderator. There was no stupid close your eyes, open your eyes. If you're a werewolf, put your thumb up. No, none of that. Everything was just open on the table, really nice and simple. And everyone got to play and there was no player elimination. Well, the thing takes that aspect of those games, the Resistance, Avalon, and throws it into this game and then combines it with the card play from Battlestar Galactica, which I found like met really well. Really well. Um, oh, I'm screwing up. I should stop reading the chat while I'm trying to talk. I guess every room game starts like that for the resistance but it only makes it once so there you go that shows how often i play the resistance so yes there is a close your eyes to figure who's on your team but that's it so it's not like an every night like werewolf you keep doing it over and over thank you and i have no idea how to pronounce it kibitz j kibitz j, kibitz j. all right thanks kibitz j all right where was i the thing so to jump back a bit, just in case you haven't seen it like me two days ago, uh, the thing, Infection Outpost 31, is based on the original John Carpenter thing, uh, starring Big Trouble in Little China fan himself, Kurt Russell. Uh, much different role for him in this one. Uh, cult classic, I 
for many, many years had to uh, wear a face of shame and say I hadn't watched, but I finally fixed that last night. Uh, to not further shame myself, I will not talk about my opinion on that movie right now. We'll just talk about the board game. Uh, so the board game's about that. So you got a bunch of people at an Antarctic base, mix of scientists and operations guys and techs. And they found an alien. In the game, you know all this. Not only did you find an alien, an alien has taken over the crew. You don't know which one. If you're playing with enough people, it's possibly two of your crew. You then have to try, as a human, to survive. You need to explore the outpost to find certain things to move on to the next section. And then you have to find other things to move to the third section. Once you've completed the third section, you jump on a helicopter and leave. The thing called the imitation in this which makes perfect sense now that I've seen the movie, um, is trying to stop this in multiple ways. So one of the ways is blow up the base. Uh, if enough rooms in the building are destroyed, they they win. Uh, the other way they win, I'm drawing a blank. There's the chopper. I'm missing the middle one. Oh, infection, right. Every time the, the humans fail on one of the, the missions, I'll get to how those work in a second, there's an infection track and that goes up. If that gets to the end, the the infections, the, I'm saying it wrong. Not infections. I always want to say it's infections. The name of the game is infection. The imitations, the imitations win the game. The last, and this is the most brilliant, is if an, an imitation can stay hidden the entire game and gets onto the chopper at the end of the game, they win. The only way the humans win is if that chopper leaves at the end of the game and it's only humans on it. So I noted it's like the resistance. So the way the game works is every round, the man with the gun, in this case, I have to say man, because that is something they, they stuck to the movie. There are no female characters. That'll disappoint some people, I realize. I know my wife was actually noted it and commented on it. You figure it's a fantasy game, like throw in some, whatever. Guess they're not in the movie. Purists would have complained the other way, I guess. The man with the gun makes the rules. He's the captain every turn. He is going to flip over a card and it's going to tell him he needs certain things. And then he's going to pick a room in the outpost to go check out. Then he decides out of all the players who goes with them to this mission. And here's where the social deduction goes in. This is where all the talking starts. This is where you're like, oh, hey, who's going with me? Right? So you're not an infected or infected imitation. Who's the imitation? Try to figure out who the imitations are. And you want all humans and the way you're going to do this is you get there and then the card's going to say, you need so many cards to win. So it'll say, you want at least three Petri dishes. Or it'll say, you need a copper wire and a fire extinguisher. Or it'll just say, roll dice and get 24 or more. And every card has a set of dice on the bottom. It'll say plus one, plus two, plus three dice. Most of them being plus one. So then we all go on the mission. Everyone who's on the mission hands a card to the the uh, captain. The captain then shuffles it because you don't want to know which cards came from what players. They get to look at it. If there's a sabotage card there, it happens. And if there's a sabotage card there, you know there was an imitation in the group. Again, deduction. That's the deduction part of the social deduction game. So you're going to sit there. You're going to look at the cards, throw any sabotage. If there's no sabotage, you then, the captain, if he brought the right people on the team, can modify his hand a bit. The way that works is every character has a different character class and different missions need different classes. What this often means is you have to, may have to bring someone you don't want along on the mission because you need their character class. So you're going to discard a card and you're going to draw another one and then kind of set the deck and then you're going to show everyone you're going to roll and see if you pass the mission. If you fail, that infection marker goes up. That's bad. If you pass, you get to search the room. When you search the room, you flip a little chit over, and hopefully you find the thing you need to go to the next section. Now, one of the things you need to go to the next section is to defeat the thing in each area. Having seen the movie, they do that an awful lot. So again, that makes sense. So first, you fight thing one. Weird-looking spider, creepy thingy. The way you fight the thing is the exact same way you do a mission. A bunch of the people on the mission hand you cards. The captain, again, gets to discard a card to draw a card. Again, he could get sabotaged. Those terrible imitations um then it tells you how many dice to roll and in this one it's unique you uses a yahtzee 
based system, which I totally didn't expect, where you're going to roll dice and you're trying to get three of a kind. And depending on what level you're playing on, you get so many rerolls. So fighting thing one, you get three, three, three rerolls and you're trying to get three of a kind. When you're fighting the level three thing, you need four of a kind and you may only get two rerolls. So you fight the thing. If you defeat the thing, it goes on this board. You clear out section one, you move on to section two. Now here's where it gets interesting. At section two, you take this little blood test pack, you shuffle it up and you deal everyone a card. If you were a thing from the beginning and you get another thing card, you just return the thing card. If you're a thing from the beginning and you get another, you get a human card, you return the human card. If you're a human and you get a thing card, you return your human card, keep the thing card. And if you're a human and you get a human, you stay human. But all this is hidden information. So you shuffle your two cards and hand one back. I think we worked it out. It was like 76% of the time you're going to add another imitation that first round. So all of a sudden, someone who's been working with you for the first half is now again. With higher player counts, there's even more chances of people swapping over. So you do section two, assuming everyone survives, you then do another blood test, another chance for another imitation to show up. Then you move into section three. When you finish section three, you get to the end game. The end game adds a voting mechanism, which I thought was pretty interesting. So in that, the person who's currently the captain has to decide who to give the gun. Whoever has that gun makes the final decision of who goes on the chopper. At that point, everyone gets to vote with a whole hold your thumb out, yay or nay. If you vote nay, then it moves to a different captain. And then the different captain, if that happens two times, because no one trusts anyone, which is highly possible at this point, that infection marker moves up. So you got to make a decision within a couple captains or you're going to lose. And then after that's done, that captain with the gun says, you, you, and you, we're on the chopper, let's go. They reveal their cards. If they're all human, the humans win. If there's an infection, ah, infection. If there's an imitation there, they lose. So rather, like, compared to BSG, that's dead simple. Compared to the resistance, that's a little complicated. But I really like the mesh of that. And probably the best part is it played in about hour and 15 minutes to an hour and a half. We played through two games in a row and we were laughing. We had a great time. It was surprisingly good. I, I am not a big social deduction fan and I found one I like quite a bit. Good to know. Glad you, glad you picked it up then. Mostly. <laughs> it wasn't cheap. There, there, there's something I did not know. USAopoly, you expect cheaper games. Production quality was good, not amazing. They did a lot of stuff that cost a lot of money, and I didn't get why. Like, parts of the board were glossy. Mm. It came with full miniatures, which oddly they call movers. Like, they say, pick up your mover and put it in the room. I've never, in all the times I've been gaming, heard miniatures called movers before. I no clue where that came from. Um, one of my miniatures was missing an arm, and this game is not cheap. Like, we're talking over 60 Canadian. So I, I'm, it's better than I thought it would be, but I found the price a little high for what I got. Right. We'll say it that way. So not necessarily worth the money, but as a game, as a game on itself, you know, if you're sitting down at someone else's table who paid for it, it's a fun game to play. Like what I recommend, this is a shameless, completely, totally shameless plug is go on Twitter and find this really cool cat at tabletop underscore deals. He spends a lot of his time sharing good prices on games, and you can probably find a pretty good price on uh, the thing right now. Good tip. All right. Well, don't forget to head over to tabletopbellhop.com to check out the full review. Did you just hear that? I did. Was that a double ding? That was. That means my shift is coming to an end. We're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us on the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Please send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or click on Ask the Bellhop on tabletopbellhop.com where you can also find regular posts, including detailed answers to questions, game reviews, the weekend review, and more. 
Another thing you can find over on the website was something I first started over on Google+. Plus. I have started creating, curating lists of tabletop podcasts, tabletop Patreons, and a new one, tabletop Twitch channels. As of two days ago, I have now migrated all of those over to the tabletop on website. So head on over there. They're just under our logo. If you know of any Patreons, podcasts, Twitch channels, vlogs, anything I've missed, please let me know. I'm trying to be as comprehensive as I can here. I want this to be a great resource for gamers to be able to find content. If you're a content creator, you want to get your stuff out to as many people as you can, and I want to help you do that. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our efforts, please go to tip the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Now, right now, our Patreon's a bit of a work in progress. We're currently tweaking our reward tiers as they originally created just for the blog side of things. I had thought about having two different Patreons, one for the audio visual for the podcast, one for the blog, but that didn't really make sense. Like you want the whole bellhop, right? You want all of it. We don't want to split our base up. So we want to include things for you, our viewers and listeners here on Twitch, listening on the podcast, as well as stuff just for blog readers. Benefits that currently include things like access to our pre-production show notes, behind the scenes blog posts, access to the Pento Suite after show, and audio, sorry, the audio from that, and access to our private Slack channel. Head over there now, you can take a look at the levels, but just know they may be being tweaked a little bit. I think the stuff that's where it is now will be there, but we're looking to add more. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you who are here live, thank you for joining us, and we welcome you to join us in the Pento Suite for an off the books after the show get together. Next week, I wrestle with a question from one of our lobby regulars, Dragon Gem. We will be discussing two-player games. The blog post is live now over at tabletopbellhop.com. I'd love for you to head over there, read it, and give me your thoughts in the comments. I have a feeling I missed a game or two. Lastly, a quick shout out to Angie Games, our chat room moderator and my blog editor, and my wife. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Thursday night, 9.30 p.m. Eastern, and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Live podcast to hit your podcatchers at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.